Blog Talk Radio. Good evening. Welcome to Mystery Babylon News Radio with Walt Stickle. My name's Tom Press, and I'm a good friend of Walt Stickle, and he's asked me to come and do a series of Wednesday night broadcasts uncovering the diabolical Jesuit foundations of the New World Order. Many of you, many of Walt's listeners have no doubt heard of the New World Order, and uh, maybe have even heard the State of the Union address uh, conducted by President George H.W. Bush and his description of this New World Order, which he never defined in his speech. Many of Walt's listeners have probably done a little research on their own into the New World Order and think they know a great deal about it. But I'm here tonight to expose one of the principal, if not the principal element of the New World Order, which is not discussed either in the mainstream media or the popular alternative media sources. This is going to be new information for most listeners. And with all information that comes through the Internet, I implore the listeners to do your own research into these subjects and to verify the truth or error of them on your own. But my research has been conducted over a period of at least a decade, and I've accumulated a library of over 400 books on the subjects, most of which I have read word for word, not only in private study, but also on my Internet radio broadcast entitled Inquisition Update, heard Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Central Time on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. You may tune in to these consecutive Wednesday broadcasts at Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio, and you may also check out my daily Internet radio program, Inquisition Update, to better your understanding of the New World Order. How many of you have ever heard of the Jesuit Order? My estimation, not many have. Many of you have heard about the Illuminati, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Institute, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, the Club of Rome, the Bilderbergers, the Trilateral Commission, and all of that, but very few, if any, have ever heard of the Jesuit order. I'm here tonight to prove that the Jesuits are literally the founders of this new world order. It's their agenda. And first I'm going to describe to you who the Jesuits are, what their goals are in the world, how they operate, and how they manifest themselves in history. Again, I implore the listeners to listen carefully, take notes, and do your own research and verify for yourself the validity of the claims that we'll make here on Mystery Babylon News Radio with Walt Stickle. First of all, a little bit about the Jesuits. The Jesuits were the Roman Catholic Church's answer to the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation, whose official start is, is universally accepted as October 31st, 1517, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church in Germany, the official start of the Protestant Reformation, recognized by Protestants and Catholics alike, told, either in the mainstream media or the alternative media, or even in our Protestant churches today, is what formed the basis of this Protestant Reformation. Now, Martin Luther and all the Protestant Reformers at that time were Roman Catholic. That was the only Christian religion known. Everyone else who adhered to the so-called Christian faith, who were not Roman Catholics, were regarded as heretics. And under the canon laws of the Roman Catholic Church, heretics were to be burned at the stake. And history records that God-fearing, Bible-believing Christians all over the world were sought after by the Roman Catholic Church and exterminated in the most heinous and gruesome means, all for the purpose of securing for the Vatican and the papacy 
the solitary claim of Christianity. But the Protestant Reformers, who were formerly Roman Catholics, read the scriptures for themselves in their own languages. Prior to this period, only the priests had access to the scriptures, and the scriptures were only in Latin, the language of the elite, and it was not understood by the common ordinary folk. So whatever one learned about Christianity, one learned by being spoon-fed by the priests, who simply didn't tell the truth about Christianity, did not tell the truth about Christ, and put all the emphasis on the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, and his priesthood. But once the scriptures were translated into the languages of the, of the common people and then made available by the printing presses, men, women, and children began to learn to read so that they could read the scriptures for themselves. And once they had read the scriptures for themselves, they came to the almost unanimous conclusion that that spoken of in the scripture as the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, was none other than the papacy. And with that foundation, that common universal belief, men and women fled from the Roman Catholic Church and joined the Protestant Reformation. They protested the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the papacy. They identified the papacy as the Antichrist to everyone to whom they spoke. They verified it by Scripture, and it was overwhelmingly convincing to most of the people that learned it, that, hear, that heard it from them, that it was true, that in the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and 18, none other was spoken of than the Roman Catholic Church, represented as the whore, and the bloody beast, the scarlet-colored beast, representing the temporal power of the Pope. And with this common belief they knew that they were following God when they led themselves out of the Roman Catholic Church. And this began the Protestant Reformation. And because of the, the Protestant Reformation, the, this Protestant knowledge that the papacy was not the vicar of Christ or the replacement of the Son of God on earth, but was instead very antichrist, they overthrew their governments the governments were servants of the papacy. They were selected by the papacy. They were held in power by the papacy. And they were dictated to by the papacy. And the people were all enslaved by the papacy through the civil power of their nations. So they overthrew their governments, and they, con they constructed their own constitutional governments, whereby the pope had no authority, and only the people had authority. They believed themselves worthy of self-government because, number one, they now recognized that Jesus was the great high priest of Christianity, and it was not the Pope. And they had a king in Jesus Christ that only he had the right to rule his people. They belonged to a new kingdom, wherein they were the citizens of. And they... They had God's law written upon their hearts. They had the liberty wherewith Christ had made them free. And they instituted their own forms of government that erased or blocked the tyranny of the papacy and gave the people liberty. And as that liberty increased, knowledge increased. People had more to do, more money in their pockets that would have ordinarily gone to the Roman Catholic Church and to the Roman Catholic monarch that ruled their nation, they had more money in their pockets, and they sent their children to colleges and universities so that they could improve their reading skills, so that they could debate the scriptures, so that they could study and read history. And increasingly, more and more and more people, as they became, un became aware of the history of the Roman Catholic Church, the history of the papacy, and the history of the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist in the world, that compounded by the inerrant word of Almighty God, perfectly describing the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church in Revelation chapter 17 and 18, and describing also its ultimate judgment by Christ when he returns. 
increasingly the world became more and more and more protestant because of this universal understanding that the papacy was completely and perfectly described in the book, in God's holy book, as the man of sin and the son of perdition, the one who exalts himself above the stars of God, who sits in the temple of God, claiming that he is God, was none other than the papacy, people began to flood out of the Roman Catholic Church, so much so that the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church was threatened with extinction. The Pope's coffers began to ring hollow. Nobody was paying their tithes to the Roman Catholic Church. They were throwing their power and strength behind the Protestant Reformation, behind Christ and the kingdom of Christ. They were citizens of a new kingdom, a spiritual kingdom, one born in spirit and in truth rather than tyranny. And this was the start of the Protestant Reformation. And had it continued without hindrance, it may well have completely and permanently destroyed the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. But there rose a dire need for the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church, and that was to stop the flood of people leaving the Roman Catholic Church and joining the Protestant Reformation. Today we know that as the Counter-Reformation. And the Counter-Reformation became the ultimate duty of a new order of priests, warrior priests in the Roman Catholic Church. A new order far superior to the Franciscans, the Dominicans, the Gregorians, and all the other monastic orders of the Roman Catholic Church. It was the Jesuit order headed up by a man by the name of St. Ignatius Loyola, a warrior of of Spanish origin, convinced the papacy that if he would allow Ignatius Loyola to assemble a militia, that they would conquer the whole world for the papacy and destroy Protestantism, destroy the protest against the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, and then twist the scriptures so that men would abandon this universally held belief that the Pope was the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. And with the end of their efforts completed, the Pope would be elevated to a universal, global monarch. King of the world. King of kings and lord of lords in a counterfeit, seemingly Christian kingdom. One moment, please. So, in 1534, remember the Protestant Reformation got its official start in October 31st, 1517. In 1534, Ignatius Loyola formed his society called the Society of Jesus. In, in, immediately, the Jesuits ran into opposition, even among the Roman Catholics of that day, and they were regarded cynically as the Jesuits. And they're known by that handle, even today, the Jesuits. But the official di- uh, title of the organization, the Militia for the Pope, is called the Society of Jesus. First, they were reviled by all the other monastic orders for daring to put the word or the name Jesus in their title. They believed that to be arrogant, especially since they were the newest of the new monkish orders of the Roman Catholic Church. But nonetheless, Ignatius Loyola promised the papacy that if left to command his militia without interference, and it, that if that militia would obey him without thought or will of their own and would, would follow his commands as though he were the very voice of God on earth, that eventually they would conquer the whole world, destroy the Protestant Reformation and all of the popular forms of government that sprang forth from the Protestant Reformation and literally elevate the papacy to global supremacy. That has been the goal of the Jesuit order. Their oath 
and their history confirm that they have been true both to their oath and their conviction and their constitution and their Jesuit general. And today, the New World Order is almost a complete success. But what is important for you and I tonight, at least in this discussion, is to describe how it was that the Jesuits conquered the most lethal opponent of the papacy, the Protestant Reformation. But before we get into that, we're going to first give you an overall, a very concise and a very brief picture of the Jesuit order. And that is most effectively done by reading and explaining the oath that each Jesuit takes when he is elevated to the rank of a superior or a, a, a commander in this militia for the Pope called the Jesuit order. Now, this is called the Jesuit oath. And every one of my listeners, every one of Walt's listeners, rather, can simply go to any search engine on your computer and type in the Jesuit oath or the extreme oath of the Jesuits, and you'll find numerous, numerous sources that record this, and you can read it for yourself. I'm taking mine from the European Institute of Protestant Studies by Ian Paisley on the Internet. That's ianpaisley.org, and you can go to Ian Paisley's website. And by the way, Ian Paisley is a true Bible-believing protestant. His faith is in Christ and Christ alone, and he sheds the papacy as a plague. And it is his purpose to educate Christians, true Bible-believing Christians, protestants about the Jesuit order. And so here now we will, we will begin a reading and discussion of the oath that every Jesuit takes when he reaches the rank of a commander in the militia of the Pope. Now the following is the text of the Jesuit Extreme Oath of Induction, quoted in the journals of the 62nd Congress, third session of the United States Congressional Record, House Calendar Number 397, Report Number 1523, dated 15th of February, 1913. And this, these are recorded on pages 3215 and 3216 of the record from which it was subsequently torn out, says Ian Paisley. Ian Paisley. It was there in the congressional record until someone ripped it out. Now, the oath is also quoted by Charles Didier in his book entitled Subterranean Rome, which was published in New York in 1843. It was translated from the French original. That's right. This oath was originally written in, uh, exposed in France, Roman Catholic France, and it says Dr. Alberto Rivera, who escaped from the Jesuit order in 1967, confirms that the induction ceremony and the text of the Jesuit oath, which he took, were identical to what we have recited here below. This has been confirmed as authentic and genuine by a former Jesuit priest by the name of Alberto Rivera. When a Jesuit of the minor rank is to be elevated to command, he is conducted into the chapel of the convent of the order, where there are only three others present, the principal or superior standing in front of the altar. On the other side stands a monk, one of whom holds a banner of yellow and white, which are the papal colors, the papal flag, and the other, a black banner with a dagger and a red cross above a skull and crossbones with the word INRI, I-N-R-I, and below the word INRI, the words Iustum Necker Regis Impious, the meaning of which is, it is just exterminate or annihilate impious or heretical kings, governments, or rulers. 
Now, I'll stop right there and explain that in the Roman Catholic Church and many even Protestant churches today, you'll find large statues of a cross with a dying Jesus nailed thereto. And at the top of the cross will be a small placard. And on that placard will be inscribed the, the initials I-N-R-I, Inri. Now, there are many explanations to the interpretation of this little word, but in the Jesuit oath, those letters represent the Latin words, I used them, necker, regis, impious. And the translation of those Latin words literally means it is just or righteous to exterminate or annihilate impious or heretical kings, governments, or rulers. Now, when you enter a Roman Catholic church and you see a huge crucifix on the wall displayed and a dying Jesus nailed there too, and this mysterious four-letter word tacked on a placard at the top of the cross, you now know what it means to a Jesuit. They're simply telling you that it was just and righteous to annihilate this impious and heretical king, government, and ruler. That is right. Jesus, to them, was a king, a government, and a ruler, and it was just for him to be destroyed. Now, many will argue with this, but nonetheless, these are the official words of the confirmed, uh, genuine Jesuit oath. Now, you can ascribe whatever meaning you care to, but it's very difficult to, to disprove what the Jesuits admit as true. Now, continuing with the ceremony of the induction of the Jesuit to a higher rank, it says, Upon the floor is a red cross at which the postulant or candidate kneels. The superior, that is, the Jesuit general, the successor of Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order, the superior hands him a small black crucifix, which he takes in his left hand and presses to his heart. And the superior, the Jesuit general, at the same time presents to him a dagger, which he grasps by the blade and holds the point against his heart, the superior still holding it by the hilt, and thus address the, addresses the postulant this way. This is the Jesuit superior speaking. Now remember, he's standing there in this solemn ceremony, holding a dagger by the handle, by the hilt, with its point pressed against the breast of the postulant, the Jesuit, who is being exalted to a rank of commander in the militia of the Pope. This is what the Jesuit general says to this new, initi to this new uh, ranking officer in the militia of the Pope. He says, My son, heretofore you have been taught to act the dissembler. Among Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic and to be a spy even among your own brethren to believe no man, to trust no man. Among the Reformers, to be a Reformer. Among the Huguenots, to be a Huguenot. Among the Calvinists, to be a Calvinist. Among other Protestants, generally, to be a Protestant. And obtaining their confidence, to seek even to preach from their pulpits, and to denounce with all the vehemence of your nature our holy religion, and the Pope, and even to descend so low as to become a Jesuit, or excuse me, to become a Jew among Jews, that you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. You have been taught to plant insidiously the seeds of jealousy and hatred between communities, provinces, states that were at peace, and to incite them to deeds of blood, 
involving them in war with each other, and to create revolutions and civil wars in countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and sciences and enjoying the blessings of peace, to take sides with the combatants and to act secretly with your brother Jesuit who might be engaged on the other side but openly opposed to that which you might be connected, only that the Roman Catholic Church might be the gainer in the end, in the conditions fixed in the treaties for peace, and that the end justifies the means. You have been taught your duty as a spy to gather all statistics, facts, and information in your power from every source, to ingratiate yourself into the confidences of family circles of Protestants and heretics of every class and character, as well as that of the merchant, the banker, the lawyer, among the schools and universities, in parliaments and legislatures, and the judiciaries and councils of state, and to be all things to all men for the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. You have received all your instructions heretofore as a novice, a neophyte, and have served as a coadjutor, confessor, and priest. But you have not yet been invested with all that is necessary to command in the army of Loyola in the service of the Pope. You must serve the proper time as the instrument and executioner as directed by your superiors. For one cannot, for one can command here who has not consecrated his labors with the blood of a heretic. Let me read that again. The superior says, for none can command here who has not consecrated his labors with the bloods of the heretic. For without the shedding of blood, no man can be saved. Therefore, to fit yourself for your work and make your own salvation sure, you will, in addition to your former oath of of obedience to your order and allegiance to the Pope, repeat after me. Now, the Jesuit general has prepared the postulate to take the oath of induction the extreme oath of induction, the, the, the oath of the fourth vow of the Jesuits. And this is the text of that oath. I, and then the postulate states his name, now in the presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed St. John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul, and all the saints, sacred hosts of heaven, And to you, my ghostly father, the superior general of the Society of Jesus, founded by St. Ignatius Loyola in the pontification of Paul III and continued to the present, do by the womb of the Virgin, the matrix of God, and the rod of Jesus Christ, declare and swear that His Holiness the Pope is Christ Vice-Regent and is the true and only head of the Catholic or universal church throughout the earth, and that by the virtue of the keys of binding and loosing, uh, loosing given to his holiness by my Savior, Jesus Christ, he hath power to depose heretical kings, princes, states, commonwealths, and governments, and they may be safely destroyed." Therefore, to the utmost of my power, I will defend this doctrine and His Holiness's right and custom against all usurpers of the heretical or Protestant authority, whatever, especially the Lutheran Church of Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, and the now pretended authority of the churches of England and Scotland, and the branches of same now established in Ireland and on the continent of America and elsewhere, and all adherents in regard, that they may be usurped and heretical, opposing the sacred mother church of Rome. I do denounce and disown any allegiance as due to any heretical king, prince, or state named Protestant or liberal, 
or obedience to any of their laws, magistrates, or officers. I do further declare the doctrine of the churches of England and Scotland, of the Calvinists, Huguenots, and others of the name Protestant or Masons, to be damnable, and they themselves to be damned, who will not forsake the same. I do further declare that I will help, assist, and advise all or any of His Holiness's agents in any place where I should be, in Switzerland, Germany, Holland, Ireland, or America, or in any other kingdom or territory I shall come to, and do my utmost to extirpate the heretical Protestant or Masonic doctrines and to destroy all their pretended powers, legal or otherwise. I do further promise and declare that, notwithstanding, I am dispensed with to assume any religion heretical for the propagation of the Mother Church's interests, to keep secret and private all her agents' counsels from time to time, as they are entrusted to me, and not to divulge directly or indirectly by word, writing, or circumstances, whatever, but to execute all that should be proposed, given in charge, or discovered unto me by you, my ghostly father, or any of this sacred order. I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion or will of my own, or any mental reservation whatever, even as a corpse or a cadaver, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope and of Jesus Christ, that I will go to any part of the world whithersoever I may be sent, to the frozen regions of the north, jungles of India, to the centers of civilization of Europe, or to the wild haunts of the barbarous savages of America, without murmuring or repining, and will be submissive in all things whatsoever is communicated to me. I do further promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly and openly, against all heretics, Protestants, and Masons, as I am directed to do to extirpate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, nor condition, and that will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs of the wombs of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate their execrable race that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisonous cup, the strangulation cord, the steel of the poniard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed to do so by any agent of the Pope, superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Father, of the Society of Jesus, in confirmation of which I hereby dedicate my life, soul, and all corporal powers, and with the dagger which I now receive, I will subscribe my name written in my blood in testimony thereof, and should I prove false or weaken in my determination, may my brethren and fellow servants of the militia of the Pope cut off my hands and feet and my throat from ear to ear, my belly be opened, and sulfur burned therein with all the punishment that can be inflicted upon me on earth, and my soul shall be tortured by demons in eternal hell forever, that I will in voting always vote for a Knight of Columbus in preference to a Protestant, especially a Mason, and that I will leave my party so to do that if two Catholics are on the ticket, I will satisfy myself which is the better supporter of the Mother Church and vote accordingly, that I will not deal with or employ a Protestant if in my power to deal with or employ a Catholic, that I will place Catholic girls in Protestant families 
that a weekly report may be made of the inner movements of the heretics, that I will provide myself with arms and ammunition, that I may be in readiness when the word is passed, or I am commanded to defend the Roman Catholic Church, either as an individual or with the militia of the Pope. All of which I, and now he states his name again, do swear by the blessed Trinity and blessed sacrament, which I am now to receive, to perform and on part to keep this my oath. In testimony thereof, I take this most holy and blessed sacrament of the Eucharist and witness the same further with my name written with the point of this dagger dipped in my own blood and seal in the face of this holy sacrament. Now, at this point, having recited the oath of a novice in the Jesuit order to a position of commandery in the military militia of the Pope, this postulant signifies his loyalty and commitment to this oath by participating in the Mass. And he receives the wafer from the Jesuit superior and then writes his name with the point of the dagger dipped in his own blood, taken from over his heart. Now, that is the oath of a Jesuit priest elevated to a position of command within the Jesuit order. Being sworn in by the Jesuit general himself, he has sworn to have no will or thought of his own and to be led about by every whim of the Jesuit general as though he were a cadaver, as though he were a, a, merely a stick in the hand of an old man that the Jesuit general may use at any time for any purpose that benefits the Roman Catholic Church. And these Jesuits all swear this oath, and the primary constituent of this oath is to extirpate and to annihilate forever the Protestant belief, the Protestant faith. And after having finally completely destroyed Protestantism, then to elevate the papacy to world supremacy. That, in a nutshell, in a snapshot, is a full picture of the Jesuit oath. This oath is the most concise description of everything pertinent to our study about the Jesuit, about the Jesuit order and the New World Order. And, again, I implore the listeners not to take my word for it but to do your own research into the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order, to do your investigation into the history of the Jesuit Order and the counter-reformation of the Roman Catholic Church, and see this for yourself. And I'm convinced, as our discussions continue here on Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio, that you'll agree with me that the principal power behind the New World Order is not the Bilderbergers, it's not the Illuminati, it's not the Club of Rome or the Council on Foreign Relations or Freemasonry, but that all of them are in service to the Jesuit general. And their whole purpose, each and individually, is to assist the Jesuit order to conquer Protestantism to destroy any belief in the world that the papacy is the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist, and then thereby to destroy Protestantism, to destroy Protestantism by making it appear to be a rebellion against the legitimate authority of the Pope as the vicar or replacement of Jesus Christ on earth and that once Protestantism is destroyed, the only enemy that the Roman Catholic Church ever had that truly threatened the very existence of the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church, that once that 
Bible-believing Christianity is routed and exterminated from the earth, then the papacy can be elevated to world supremacy as the global governor of the world calling himself the vicar or the replacer of the Son of God in a phony, counterfeit kingdom of Christ on the earth. Our Lord said, My kingdom is not of this world. But the Pope says that the Roman Catholic Church is a visible society. The universal church is a visible society, and it must have a visible head. And that is the Pope. Now, many of Walt's listeners have all their lives believed that the Roman Catholic Church is a Christian denomination. That's a lie. It is what all the the Protestant reformers called it, the synagogue of Satan. And the man that rules over the synagogue of Satan is the Pope, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. It might surprise some of my listeners tonight to realize that if you don't protest the papacy, if you don't accept the papacy as the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of history, then you can't rightly call yourself a Protestant. But as we continue our studies every six, uh, consecutive Wednesday night, we'll discover that Protestantism was not the first to discover that the papacy fulfilled all the prophecies of the Bible regarding the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, that there have always been Christians, stemming all the way back, even those sitting under Paul's ministry, the Thessalonians, knew who the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist would be. And I would love to tell you about it, but I've run out of time, and that will be the lead-in for the next Wednesday's program on Walt's Mystery Babylon Radio. And my name is Tom Fress, host of Inquisition Update, heard Monday through Friday at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. And until I see you again next Wednesday, blessings be upon you. Please do the research, confirm some of these things for yourselves and be ready to continue our, our, our discussion next Wednesday on Babylon Mystery, Radio, uh, Mystery Babylon Radio, a news radio by Walt Stickle. Thanks for the invitation, Walt. It was my pleasure and my blessing, and I leave you with blessings from on high. The truth will set you free. I'll see you next time.